And we're on. Marty Gallagher, thanks for being on the show. My pleasure. Yeah, so I don't remember the first time that I heard about you. It was a long time ago. I, I started as a um, personal trainer in 1999. So I'm sure you were in, and I've been like reading about the, you know, since I was like seven years old. So I'm sure you were somewhere in the magazines and stuff that I was reading. And then uh, I started learning more when I got into like kettlebells and reading like Pavel Satsu and, and then him mentioning you. And then you know, I read your books, the purpose, purposeful primitive, strong medicine and then articles. And uh, what was really drawing my interest besides yeah, you can squat a whole bunch and you have these, you know, uh, you know, amazing numbers in your lifts is, like digging into like the Zen part of it. And, um, and, and from my view of looking at it, like, like we were just about to start talking about before we hit record is like lifting as kind of an internal martial art or blending the internal martial art with the lifting using yes. those uh, techniques. So um, if we could start there, if you could you just want to, Give your perspective of like maybe how you how you started because you yeah like I was just reading say you had your first meet in nineteen sixty eight. Oh uh, no 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 that's uh, that's actually a little late. I started uh, lifting weights in nineteen sixty one as an eleven year old, and okay. then uh, uh, my first formalized mental recalibration program is what we were introduced into the the whole Soviet Iron Curtain auto-visualization, which was what the, the Soviet lifters used. Uh, you'd see them if you'd see any of the great Russian lifters of the 60s and the 70s, and they, they stride out to the, and even the 80s, and they stride out to the barbell, and they're just standing there with their eyes closed, and everybody's going, what are they doing? What they're doing is that they're running a repetitive movie of themselves doing the about to happen lift and they run it over and over and over and uh it drills into their mind this this image and this pattern of success so that's what we were taught to do we were taught to now you don't you don't have to use auto visualization on your you know 135 pound warm-up but on your heavy sets yeah you recalibrate your mind you you purposefully uh, you're trying to put yourself in the zone, right? And what the what the Soviets and the Iron and the East Germans scientists discovered that is that this actually works. Um, this this it hones technique. Uh, it it puts you in the proper headspace that you need to for the specificity of the event that you're doing. It's not just confined to weightlifting. You'll see. Uh, elite bobsled drivers you know at the winter olympics and before it's their time you're, they're they're looking at them backstage and their eyes are closed and they're doing this and what they're doing is auto visualization there they're running themselves through that whatever 2.8 mile course whatever it is over and over every turn everything over and over and over and over and over and if you do it for a lot of years i started doing that auto visualization i guess when i was 12 uh, by the time I was 17, I'd won a national championship as an Olympic weightlifter, right? And uh, I had my auto-visualization technique down pretty good. And so in 1970, it was a short hop, skip, and jump from Soviet East German auto-visualization into uh, formalized meditation, right? And... Did you have a meditation teacher? Are you reading these from books? Did you have combination? Uh, you know, I think the jump in for me was uh, Parmasana Yogananda's autobiography of yoga. So that kind of led me into all the Hindu nomenclature, and you get into the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads and you know, the, the different Indian saints, Sri Aurobindo, Ramakrishna you know, you work through the, the Hindu literature and they have a very, and I was looking for the, 
the nuts and bolts of the meditational techniques, right? Mm -hmm. I, I was not seeking enlightenment. I wasn't seeking a religion. I wasn't seeking, you know, what I wanted was uh, I wanted to see how they were altering their minds and if there was anything that they were doing that I could take back to the world of athletics. Okay. And in the, the Hindu, it was interesting. The Hindu, it's very um, in, in, internalized with, um, with a high level Hindu meditator. They can shoot a gun off behind their head and they won't hear it. Right. Mm. They, they're able to shut it out. Now, you do the same thing with a high level Zen master, and they hear it, but they don't react to it. Right. Right. So it's a, it's a difference. If you look at the, the Hindu tradition of the, the Fakirs, the, the guys who would lay on nails and, you know, uh, bury themselves, and what they were doing is they were using meditational and breath techniques to do these extraordinary feats to, you know, bring attention to their, you know, their gurus, their religion, their practices. So, you know, you work through that. And then from then I went into the Zen and, you know, in, in the Zen tradition, you have Soto and Rinzi and the, you know, the Rinzi is Kon, K-O-A-N. And they give you a, I don't know, an unsolvable riddle mm. and you ponder it and ponder it and ponder it till eventually your, um, your conventional discursive reasoning is, is pierced and, you know, you have a, a burst of enlightenment. Right. Yeah. The, the set of school is different. They're just like, we don't seek anything. Just sit, you know, just do the work. And uh, they, that's uh, the Dogen Zenji uh, that founded that that school. And that appealed to me mightily, this idea of just don't have any thoughts of gain. Just sit and just get into the mechanics of the breathing and the posture, and the, you know, the uprightness. And uh, and just do that. And don't, don't have don't be seeking to see visions or, you know what I mean? Or, 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 or religious euphoria. So, you know, you work through that. And then uh, from Zen, we jumped off into uh, the Taoist to China, you know, and there it's uh, the Northern Chinese tradition of Taoism. And of course the Taoist uh, and the, and also in Zen, the Zen was heavily linked to the, to the Buddha, to the samurai, to the warrior, and uh, they had a Mokosan, which was uh, application of meditation for heavy sport and combat. And they'd use it, a lot of the uh, Kendu players would use it right before they, you know, beat the hell out of each other, with, you know, with sticks. And the idea is you want to place yourself in a mindless, wordless state that makes you completely receptive to incoming if you're intuitive you're more able to deal with the spontaneous actions of an opponent if you're preoccupied well then you have an achilles heel right right yeah the zen stuff appealed to me i i started reading about like the yoga stuff philosophy in different ways when i was I got my first two yoga books at a, a Grateful Dead concert in 1994. Mm. And uh, it was like Krishna consciousness stuff about the Bhagavad Gita, that kind of stuff. And then um, I started Japanese jujitsu when I was 18. That was 1997. Okay. And every class uh, had 10 minutes of meditation at the end, Zen meditation, real formal. And uh, then sometimes we had like hour long meditations where like 20 minutes seated and then a walking meditation in between uh, yep. sets. And yeah, the like not seeking anything particularly amazing, just like there, it can be like real, um, not very exciting, <laughs> but that's, uh, but exciting things can happen, but that's not just like you're saying, that's not what you're, 
what you're chasing. And uh, so when you're, you're already lifting and then you're, you're reading about this stuff, when did, how did you start making the connection between like say doing a deadlift and what maybe uh, uh, the, the, the samurai are talking about, like with the, the Soto Zen, Zazen and. Well, what's the commonality? The, the mental commonality is that whether it's um, a limit attempt and you don't have to be an elite athlete or an elite warrior, but just a, a limit attempt, something 100 or 102 percent of your particular capacity. Uh, yeah, that uh, that creates a, what I term a, a hormonal tsunami. When you have intense physical effort, for example, uh, absolute strength consists of you know short movements, maximum payload, uh, power lift, you know, a squat, a deadlift, a bench press. You know, these are very short movements, but you're using maximum weight, no real regard for velocity. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you work at 100% of your capacity, whether it's a three rep set or a five rep set or an eight rep set, you'll have a, a hormonal release. Your, your body will release hormones. It doesn't happen if you're cruising along at 75 to 80% of capacity. And that's what a lot of people miss. A lot of guys are doing like, I do five times five. Well, that's great, but that's never a hundred times one, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the hormonal release, and it's, it's endorphins, it's adrenaline, it's serotonin, it's, it's a half a dozen different chemicals that release into the body and it creates a, what you know we call the after workout bliss state you know how good you feel after a really kick-ass workout mm -hmm. that's attributable to hormone hormonal release okay you just feel good right and, it's, and also if you've been successful in the workout that compounds it <clears throat> so but what athletes didn't realize is that when they achieve that that post-workout hormonal bliss it's actually an advanced meditational state right what's the goal of meditation the goal of meditation whether it's hindu taoist zen whatever is to achieve that mindless where the the internal thinker the observer the talker falls silent but mm -hmm not from some act of willpower you can't you can't use your mind to force your mind to be quiet that's just another clever act of will it, the mind has to fall silent of its own accord extreme effort will cause it to fall silent of its own accord uh, right. intense meditation can do that but extreme exercise is a lot quicker um jumping off the side of a mountain in a wingsuit <laughs> will give you that same hormonal excitation. Jumping off a bridge with a bungee cord. We, we do it through squats and deadlifts and bench presses, right? And we also recognize it for what it is, and it is an advanced meditational state. Athletes just didn't recognize it as such, and they haven't nurtured it as such. We're just pointing it out. So it's sort of an intense training the intense progressive resistance training is sort of a backdoor to, you know, advanced meditational states. Kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's right where I am too. When I was starting out, I was like, you know, studying martial arts and okay, well, what are these people from Japan saying? And what about the people from China and India? And like, okay, they're using different words for the same thing. Like what do they have in common? okay, I'm going to do that. You know, the one thing that the guy that's far off, he's the only one saying this thing. Um, maybe I'm not going to pay attention to that right now. I'm going to do the stuff that they're all talking about. And so just like focus on uh, that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, sometimes, um, you know, uh, so I, I was a strong first instructor for four years. Um, and, so reading about Pavel Sadzu and 
when I first started reading about him, like about 10 years ago or whatever it was, he seemed to kind of em embody what I was trying to do. It's not about the lift. It's like what you can do other than just lift the weight and, and like apply it to martial arts. And so I'm reading and then end up getting certified through him. And then uh, one of my partners at the, at my gym, I have, I have a gym here in Indianapolis is Valeri Fedorenko. And so I'm learning all this stuff that, that Pavel says, and then Valeri Fedorenko, everything is completely the opposite. And he's, but he has the one, he has all these world records and he does all these insane I love, feet. I, I love world records. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's proof yes, that indeed. what you're doing works. And so his breathing, it's the opposite. You know, he <laughs> exhales at the bottom wing. He inhales at the, at the top. He, or at, at the, he inhales through his mouth and his nose at the same time, uh, doing the, lifting up on the jerk. And it's like exact opposite. So have you found like you have this method and it, it's working and then somebody else is doing something uh, he, that has better numbers. It's like, yeah, actually I do everything the opposite of what uh, I, I'm. I'm a product of a school of strength. I was, um, I had the, good fortune, I guess, of growing up in an area that was a hotbed of Olympic weightlifting. And I got good instruction right from the very start by experienced, seasoned men, mm -hmm. right? So I was drilled and schooled in the techniques and they drilled into me a, a reverence for technique. Olympic lifting is different. Again, you, when you think of strength, you have to generalize in three three broad categories. On the extreme left, you would have absolute strength, and that would be the power lifts, and that would be maximum payload, short distance, no real regard for velocity. Okay. Then in the middle, you'd have explosive strength, the Olympic lifts, right? And that's moderate payload, maximum velocity long distances right? right okay then on the extreme right you'd have strength endurance or sustained strength which would be light payloads long duration yeah, velocities can vary you know it doesn't matter that's like uh, the mma guys they love uh, they're they're sustained strength masters they do stuff like you know pick up a hundred pound heavy bag and run up a hill Right. That that's sustained strength. You're injecting an element of strength into a cardiovascular format, right? Muscular contraction in a sustained fashion. Build a bigger gas tank. So but you have to have elements of all three: absolute strength, explosive strength, sustained strength, to have a comprehensive program. If you concentrate on any one or the other, you know, you become not all that you could be. It's not optimal. Right. Right. Body, bodybuilding, for example, that's a high volume, moderate intensity. When Schwarzenegger was at his peak in the 70s, he was doing 700 sets a week. <laughs> yeah. That was mad. 700. Like, I think my guys, our power lifters, we might do 50 a week, 50 sets a week. Low volume, high intensity, short sessions. I've got a lot of guys that are just uh, strength training once a week and get incredible results. Yeah, that was something else. I actually wrote that in my, in my notes to ask you about because you, you were around Arnold and you weren't, didn't you like actually – go there and like you were counting his sets because he was going there twice a day. No, 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 no. It, it, there's a great, fantastic book by a guy named Rick Wayne, who was the editor in chief of uh, muscle builder magazine. And, and, and Rick wrote, wrote a really great book called three more reps. And in it, he outlined Schwarzenegger's exact training routine when he won the 76 Olympia. And what he did is he trained, 
six times a week, twice a day. He'd go in the morning and do, I don't know, calves, forearms, abs, and then come back in the evening and, you know, he would train each muscle three times a week. Uh, and he trained six days a week, twice a day, 700 sets a week. Incredible, incredible. You know, and again, just like, like working in a coal mine. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was something I was wanting to ask about too, because you were, I was listening to um, another video you were on and you're comparing Arnold's 700 sets uh, a week compared to the, the guys that have the manual labor jobs and the families. And so uh, they're just too busy to go to the gym. And then on Sundays, but you know, they, they don't have any, also they don't have any energy because they work highly physical jobs. Yeah. If you're if you're humping shingles at a construction site, you know hiking up ladders with a hot or full of bricks or whatever, you know what I mean. You know, you just you don't you don't have it during the week. You're just exhausted. So the classically, what they do is they rest up on Saturday, and then we hit it on Sunday, right? Yeah. And in two hours, we just do all the absolute strength training for the week: squat, bench press, deadlift, overhead press, maybe some arms. See you later. And they're done that they're done for the week and everybody's making gains. This isn't like treading water. It's we've been doing this for five years and it's, you know, regular guys making sensational gains. They're all competitive lifters. All their lifts are going through the ceiling since they've been doing this stuff, but we're sticklers on technique. And, uh, you know, when you're lifting in front of other people, alpha males whose opinion you value you know you're up your game right. and you have my and you have myself and six-time world champion kirk karwaski sitting 15 feet away from me that don't help either mm. yeah we don't, suffer, we don't suffer fools likely and no one talks when someone's lifting there's no mm -hmm. there's no yakety yak you get the respect when you're lifting you give the respect when they're lifting so, and when right. we have, we have weak people, we have beginners. I got a kid, this is his third ever progressive resistance training session, but he's such a specimen. It's like, we call him Pat the project. <laughs> he's like 35 years old, has never done any serious lifting in his life, but he's got a bone structure like a, you know, silverback gorilla. It says, Hey bud, you know, you want to become a monster? He goes, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> so he's trained once a week and you know what did he do today well, i think this is his third deadlift session and he pulled i don't know 365 for five <laughs> correct it's pretty good yeah he says this this which you, you know he's talking while he's doing it how's this and I just yeah that's great keep going <laughs> and we're holding him back you know he probably could do four or five for five if we let him but it's like no you know just slow roll this thing yeah we got years with this kid years yeah it's something i think about a, a, a lot because i have the gym but i also have uh, what i call my job job that i work from 6 a.m to 2 30 and then i have clients at the gym do martial arts a couple times a week and yeah. it's uh, exhausting. have all this stuff going so sometimes i only get in one uh like pretty hard Real. session per week but I can make, uh, I'm not, I'm definitely not going backwards. And then I can kind of like look back over time and I'm, you know, doing, uh, better at many things over time. And you think part of that is, uh, like the amount of recovery time, you, you get plenty of recovery time in between. If you're just doing the ones, even if you have kind of like a manual labor job, you kind of get used to it where if you're, yeah. In the gym. It's not, it's not deadlifting 500. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. it works. Uh, and again, I think that also uh, <clears throat> we've been revisiting the whole thing of if, if you're hitting legs, if you're knocking the hell out of legs on Sunday and then hitting chest and arms on Tuesday and then uh, let's see, back and shoulders on Friday, 
is the body ever really rested? Right. It kind of gets these jolts. You know, every couple of days, bang, that's a different body part. And the rationale is, well, <clears throat> we're going to knock the hell out of the chest, but the legs can rest. Mm -hmm. Right? Well, maybe recovery is a whole body event. Right? Yeah. So that's why we're, I think, part of the reason that we're having success with this once every seven day thing um, is they're, they are, they're rested for absolute strength training like we do, but when they come in. Now, they tried to hit it on Tuesday and again on Thursday, plus working, you know, hard jobs. It's like, wow, at, uh, you know, you, you'll never, at, at best, you'll be able to perform at, you know, what, 100% of your 82% fatigue effort. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, if you're always fatigued, the, the best effort is you're 100% rested and you give 102% effort. That's where the gains are. Right. right. Who cares if you give 102% effort, but you're only at 83% of capacity because you're fatigued. Right. Yeah. And I, um, you were talking about like the, if you have like five, five guys training together, yeah. are you, are you, um, are you timing the rest period or is it no, it's just no, your turn? No, 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 but, but, but we, uh, guys aren't sitting in straddle loungers. You know what I mean? I mean, it's like, no, but I mean, by the time you have five, if you have, let's say five guys per platform, which is a good amount, it's a good pace, right? You know, change the way, you know, this guy goes, like, by the time you have five guys go, you're ready, let's go. There's no need, you don't need 20 minutes rest. You really don't, I swear to God. I mean, I've been training with world champions since the time I was 14, Yeah. right? And uh, actually that's all I've ever trained with. Uh, and it's a, a, a lineage and people speculate on how, you know, the all time greats train, but it's, you know, I know, right. I know how it, I wrote the book on Ed Cohn, you know, you know what I mean? I, I, I trained Karwaski. I, I mentored under Hugh Cassidy, huge Cassidy, the first world champion, first world heavyweight powerlifting champion. So you have when you work with the best of the best, you see how they move, how they pace their workouts, you know, how, how and when they exert, how hard they exert, you know, how they psych, right? Mm -hmm. How they walk, talk, look and act, right? The best, the best of the best of the best. Right. Yeah. And as, as a competition coach, I worked with Lamar Gant, uh, Joe Ladnier, uh, you know, a who's who of every great powerlifter on the face of the planet. Uh, I've, I've, I've worked with in competition. And <clears throat> that's when you see who rises and who wilts. You know, it's not, it's a strange, strange thing, pure strength. Uh, but this is all gone. This is all 20 years back. I, I don't, I haven't, I've, I've been off the scene for a long time. I basically stay in my isolation and do my, my Tao thing, my Taoist thing. And, mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, that's what I do. That's what I do every day. How does the, have you seen the, how have you seen the, the training frequency uh, influence how long into somebody's, life they can train at a i guess relatively high level so that's something i think about too because I'm, I'm not really trying to break world records i'm oh i want to be healthy and strong oh, when i'm old oh, i want to be a good martial artist when i'm old we, and we, we I, I listen I, I, i'm i'll be 70 in april okay and we have a, we have a phrase dare to be weak <laughs> okay mm. right You've got to make allowances for age. Yeah. But here, here's what I'd know. I can work at 100% of my current capacity. Right. I can beat whatever I did last week. 
Yeah. I'm not comparing myself to 1983. Okay. But I compare myself to last week. Right. And I yeah. can prove on that. Trust me. And that's enough. But I can't fudge on the rules. The techniques have to be crisp. There has to be uniformity and uh, there has to be a consistency. I'm not only trained once a week, but uh, I trained today. I trained my, I had my once a week training session today and knocked, knocked the hell out of it, you know? But I had, you know, if you only do it once a week, let me tell you, you think about it going into the session. That's another thing. Mm. You don't get, uh, I've got five sessions this week and, you know, I think people train too much, man. I don't think they put enough emphasis on, on you know, less is better if less is more intense. Yeah. Both, both physically and psychologically. Yeah. It's something I think about a lot because I, I end up doing, like I said, about once per week of a, a hard workout and I like record videos. So I might, when I'm like recording videos, I'm not, uh, using the heaviest weight I can to show off for the video. I'm, I'm demonstrating with a pretty moderately lightish weight, but I'm still no like doing stuff. No one cares. Right. <laughs> you could wave around a 600 pound kettlebell and no one would notice. Right. You know what I mean? It's, 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 a, it's, that's the, that's the thing. Everyone in their, their ego has like, there's some audience of, of 10,000 that's, that's watching their every move. And it's, no one's there, dude. <laughs> yeah. Just just be weak, but but be precise and be technically accurate and, and use full range of motion and make it harder, not easier. Right. In right. in terms of progressive resistance training. Uh we do cardio, we love cardio. And we'll mix it up. We'll do steady state long distance. I love to sprint. I think sprinting is the best complement for hardcore resistance training. Yeah. Um you know, and then the nutrition, you have to have a nutritional uh, element. Uh, you know, I live in the country, so we like, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, gourmet peasant food, you know, with the country vegetables and the butchered meat from <clears throat> animals that, you know, are local, uh, organic, you know, that kind of a, a vibe. Mm -hmm. So everybody's healthy because we're strong externally from the lifting we're strong internally from the cardio we got a good diet thing going and you know um, I, no one's on medication no one gets sick but strong people are resilient right have you changed your um like see one like point of uh, controversy is is the trap bar and uh, i don't know nothing about that you uh you ever you don't ever use those or have like opinions on them or yeah next yeah uh, <laughs> yeah I was just I was just like wondering like how you may have changed your no uh do you, is there like a no Nothing change like changed. range of motion for your squats no. or change no. anything no everything no. is the no. same no. as no. it always has just do I was taught to me because. What I was taught was you use extreme range of motion. You can't get no more extreme than the extreme all you can do. That's it. Yeah. And our benches were long pauses and our deadlifts were locked out and we weren't allowed to let the weight settle on the floor. It was touch and go deadlifts and yeah. no one dropped deadlifts in my day. Are you kidding me? That gets you kicked out. Mm. Yeah. Everyone now, they pull a deadlift to the top and then they drop it. Oh, look at me. I'm so strong. 405. <laughs> five yeah. reps everywhere. look at me look at me i can drop this weight and it's like if you did that in Hugh Cassidy's basement first you get your ass kicked and then you get thrown out because you it would be impolite you know you're gonna drop poundage in somebody's basement because you don't want to do the negative well the negatives were all the gains and the growth is uh, yeah control control go. both ways makes makes sense to yeah. me you don't throw away the negative in the deadlift. I mean, in the bench press, you don't throw away the negative in the squat. Why would you throw it away purposely in the deadlift? Because it's easier. Just drop it and then invent some rationale as to why that's superior. Yeah. It doesn't change it that it's not. Right. Sorry.
Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so you're you're are you still training like military units and like you? Uh... Yeah, but I like to keep that on the down low. Yeah, I work with the I work with the best of the best of the best. But they, they, let's just leave it at this. They're attracted also to the minimalism because of how many skill sets they have to keep on top of. Right. If you're right. An, if you're an active duty commando, well, what do you got to do? You got to get practice jumping out of airplanes. You got to practice uh, combat fighting. You got to practice knife fighting. You got to practice pistol shooting. You got to practice what else? Defensive driving, diffusing a nuclear bomb. I don't know. You, you know what I mean? And, and all those skill sets you have to revisit or you'll lose them. So they came to me and they said, well, uh, we, we understand and we love the need for strength. We don't have any time. Can you help us? And I went, Oh, I got just the program for you. Mm -hmm. When they're stateside, they're very busy. Now when they're deployed, they have a lot more time. So that's when I usually turn them over to my, my partner, Jim Steele, <clears throat> university of Pennsylvania strength coach, 20 years. And Jim opens, expands their training program because they're you know they're like sitting around they're bored so it's like okay let's do some more training but it's still keeping with the same generalized philosophy of, of of fewer movements done with more intensity right, right. so yeah and are they uh can I say like what what techniques are they doing is it the squat bench deadlift yeah, are they yeah, doing yeah. and yeah absolutely yeah, absolute strength. If you want to get that Mike Tyson knockout strength or that that brute strength is what they want. They don't need cardio. They get plenty of cardio doing their damn job, right? Right. And they really don't need explosive strength all that much because they do a lot of explosive stuff. Leaping, bounding, jumping, fighting, you know what I mean? But what they really like is that absolute strength, that brute, brutal strength that also builds muscle and power and it's like give us that that's what yeah. we all want more of that that helps us hump our 80 pounds of gear easier that helps us hump mortar base plates easier that helps everything that helps us if we have to drag a, a, a comrade off the field while he's wounded and i have to return fire with the other hand and he weighs 280 pounds with his gear on but I only have a 250 pound deadlift, so I can't do anything about it. Mm. Unacceptable. Right. Yeah. I saw they recently changed the requirements that or the, the PT requirements for the army to have the deadlift. They use the trap bar, but whatever. And, yeah. and then some other uh, strength they have to meet. It's, the a, it's, it's a totally different. There's, that's like the yeah. difference between, uh, you know, uh, it's it's completely different right and i have no connection with that world yeah that that generalized world that now this is this is different this yeah is the, yeah now, I, my people are motivated professionals and they want the knowledge i don't have to convince them of the knowledge and I'm not interested in, turn, in, in, in talking to anybody that's not motivated. It's not my job. I'm not here to motivate you. If you don't want to get motivated, well, just step aside because I know that there are plenty of people are. And I will work with a, a highly motivated, out of shape person before I will work with an unmotivated superstar. I learned yeah. a lesson on that. So. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Like, what kind of um, like warm up st stuff do you do? Or is is the warm up just the lift? Just doing, like li the lift, lighter, li lighter set to the lift. But again, we're using full and complete range of motion, so it's highly specific. And we take small jumps. We don't take big jumps. You know, thirty pound jumps is pretty standard for us. So you know, you go. 135, 165, 195, 225, 255, 285, 350. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And just at every bus stop, whoever wants that poundage jumps in. You know, who wants two, who wants 295? Oh, yeah, okay. Step up, do your set, whatever your 
prescribed reps are, because it'll differ, step back out. Everybody has a periodized regimen that it's a 12 week cycle and they'll have a, a target. Every time they come in that door, they have a target poundage and reps in each lift for that day. And they make that and they check it off and then they move on. But no one just walks in and goes, ah, oh, well, then we're, you know, no, everybody has a, a predetermined goal. And uh, so what kind of, uh, so at your, so the, the warm ups it takes, you know, of course, the higher the weight, the more, the longer it takes to get there, right? But is it, like, how, like, how do you, um, uh, like, say how many, like, what kind of, like, programming or, or cycles do you vary the kind of program? Okay, I'm going to do a, yes. a linear cycle. Yes, yes, yes. And yes. then a we wave love, cycle. We, and Yeah. Well, we love contrast. If you've done 12 weeks where you're concentrating on power and strength, which almost invariably includes some lean muscle up, right? A little bit heavier eating, okay? Probably a little less cardio. What better contrast than after you do 12 weeks, three months of that, go, man, I'm tired of that. Let me shift back the other direction. Let's do a moderate poundage, higher volume lifting, more frequent sessions, more cardio. Let's lighten up the eating, right? So now we're shifting back. Now you're refining that size that you built. And it's like, and then we like to sync it up with the seasons. Like what better time to add size and strength than in the deepest of the winter? Mm. What better time to get maximally ripped than in August? Right? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And then the, the spring and the fall are transitional, always. But the deepest of the winter, well, that's when I want to, well, I live, in, I live in the mountains of Pennsylvania. So that's when I want to, you know, add the plates in the bar and eat some, you know, lamb stew and, right? And it's different. And then in the summertime, it's like, okay, lighter, more, faster more cardio, more activity, because it's the summertime, less eating, who cares, you know, I mean, it's like eating, who even thinks about that, right, because we're so yeah. active, and, and that, and then you get maximally ripped, and then you get tired of that, come fall, and it's like, wow, man, I'm so skinny, let's put some size back on, right, <laughs> and it's just a, it's just a very nice, holistic ebb and flow, and it actually ties into primordial, you know, if you look back, for eight, there was 800,000 years of man before agriculture was invented. Agriculture was only invented 10,000 years ago, very recent development. Before that, <clears throat> people, it's in their DNA. We're seasonal. You know? Well, I mean, if you're, if you're in our, my kind of climate, your kind of climate, too. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense be getting in tune with the, the seasons and what kind of like naturally happens. Yeah. There's like some, um, I work at a, I train at a, a wilderness survival school also, teach like strength, yeah. conditioning, martial arts stuff. And uh, it's, it's divided into like the eight directions, um, but also uh, seasonal things. Yeah. And um, so it just kind of like makes sense, like what you eat, what you do, the activity and so it's, there's definitely something to being in tune with the seasons and uh, what you, what there is to eat naturally, and then what your body you, can do with that energy makes and you, sense. You can't, and, you, and you can't train the same or eat the same all year round and expect radical changes. Right. You know, why would the body dramatically transform itself because you keep doing what you're the same stuff <laughs> right where is the incentive there man right mm -hmm. what do you got to do well you got to do something dramatically different not barely different dramatically different you gotta jolt you gotta jolt it a little bit and 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 hopefully you've you've had a nice run 
and you've made some good gains in whatever direction you've selected. Now it's time to slash back the other direction. And it keeps the body guessing and, you know, you just don't want to fossilize. You have to see it all the time. Every time I go to the YMC, I, I can go two years apart and I'll see the same people doing the same exercises with the same poundage at the same time of day. You know, they don't change or they get older or they get worse. But it's, you know, and it's, and everybody's working at that, you know, 60 to 75% level and they ride the bikes and it's just not enough. Yeah. There's not enough intensity there to, to, to cause the body to, to do anything about it. And the body grows muscle as a defensive measure. If you don't stress it, there's no need for it to grow that muscle. The, the muscle is there to help, to help the trauma. Mm. Right, to help to help help it against these future attacks where it's continually overloaded we can't we can't deal with this help us what what do we do oh i've got an idea let's build some more muscle then we'll yeah. be better able to resist this continual onslaught of more than we can handle oh well that's how we grow mm. but if there's no continual onslaught right same with cardio you're not going to melt fat. First off, you're not going to melt fat if you have a bad diet. You can, man, you can run a marathon. You can be a cardio fanatic. You can be cardio three hours a day. But if you don't have the nutrition in, in control, you'll never melt that fat. The fat doesn't come off if there's insulin in the bloodstream. Boom. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And when you're... Um... All right, changing things up, I I was listening to, I don't remember which which video it was now, but you were talking about like kettlebell front squats, like like for people. Yep. Goblet training. squat. That's our entry level squat. We love the goblet squat. Mm -hmm. Te teaches all the right angles, upright torso, vertical shins, knees over ankles. Uh, you know, when you arise, nothing but leg power. That's what we want in our squats. And we try to replicate that goblet squat to the front squat, again, with the up, you know, vertical torso, vertical shins, nothing but the femurs moving. Then, uh, and only then, do we allow them to go to high bar back squat and, again, hopefully replicate that vertical shin, vertical torso, nothing moving but the femurs then and only then low bar back squat if most trainees jump in on low bar back squat then it's just an invitation to bend forward and it turns the the world's best leg exercise into some sort of half ass back exercise like a good morning uh, yeah it's 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 um it's mal it's exercise malpractice yeah i like the kettlebell front squat i often use two Depending on what I'm doing. Yeah. Sometimes I just like one heavy one on, on one side, sometimes using two. And it it's, uh, it's deceptively hard if I'm using two 70 pounders. It'll, it'll give you all you can handle, brother. Yeah. If, if you can do a, a lot of people, there's no need to ever progress past kettlebell squats. Okay. If, if, if you, if you conk your legs out on, on, on five reps, I mean, it doesn't matter what the implement is. Mm -hmm. Right, and the technique is so fabulous with the with the goblet squat again because it's all leg. That's what we want in our squats, all leg. Yeah. So and yeah, yeah. Knock that. I mean, just push that, man. We we push it up when you can do ten reps. You know, again, ass on heels, all the way down, all the way, all the way locked out. When you can do ten reps, get a bigger bell. And often what we'll do, you know, there's big jumps between the bells. <clears throat> we'll tape a uh, two and a half or a five pound plate on the bottom of the bell with duct tape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you track it, right? Mm -hmm. That way you don't have to jump from whatever, you know, there's some big spaces between those bells. Yeah. 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 They're, I'm, I'm a big fan of those. I think they, they apply well to, uh, like I'm always thinking like how does stuff apply to martial arts? And if you have like a couple, what, whether it's one or two 
heavy kettlebells in the in the front it, it kind of helps you stay upright like if you're uh, resisting takedowns or even going for your own like upper body throws and that kind of stuff to me it, it really uh, applies uh, has um, to those situations when I, I do, like you, it. do you uh, you ever do like the Jefferson deadlifts and no just no, we, the, with, the, the most the, the only variation that we'll do is we'll, we will have the guys in again in the off season how do you create contrast in the deadlift well one thing you can do is you can do deadlifts off standing on 100 pound plate if you're a conventional deadlifter. So it's so maybe two and a half to three inches. Mm. So you put the start of the deadlift at a deficit. And by putting it at a deficit, when you go back to the floor, it feels, oh, so much easier. Yeah. Right. So we'll do that. Also, we'll do what they call rack pulls, where we'll uh, load it up and, and pull for maybe the last six inches. And that builds uh, upper back, uh, traps, rhomboids, and also grip power. So we like that. Those would be the two, the only two assistants. We spend a lot of time doing the deadlift because it's such a complex technical exercise. We want, we want practice on it. It's, it's, uh, to me, it's the most difficult. It took me 10 years to perfect my deadlift form. Hmm. It's like a sword. It's like a, a samurai with a sword pattern it's just yeah. uh it's it's a matter of at the at the highest level it's a matter of uh, millimeters mm -hmm. so yeah how often are you throwing the the rack pulls in uh, i like those because you could just how, how you can just put ridiculous amount of weight on and yeah, uh, yeah. it feels pretty everybody, safe yeah everybody likes that plus the, what they'll do is they'll they'll wear straps so then they can really partially pull some weight the problem with it is that rack pulls by themselves it's uh it's fool's gold because the whole game in deadlifting is getting it to that position it's the first two thirds of the movement the last third of the movement is easy you get to the you get to the through the first two thirds nobody loses a deadlift at the top uh, other than grip right mm -hmm. So, uh, again, we would only do rack pulls in the off season, the off season being preseason is 12 weeks leading up to a competition, actually 13 weeks leading up to a competition. The off season is the time after the competition before you have to start the next pre meet cycle. So op ideally you'd have, if you had two competitions a year, which would be 12 weeks and 12 weeks, that would be 24 weeks. Then you'd have two off seasons of 12 weeks and 12 weeks. That'd be 48 weeks. Then you'd have what, six weeks of, well, four weeks of, you know, vacation. Right. Yeah. Do you ever go the other way, like set the, uh, the bar underneath another bar? So you pull up to like, your knees and then hit the bars and just like have like the a loaded isometric pulling into the rack that way. Oh, that's, that's real old school. That's, that's the way we used to do it back in, uh, back when the racks first came out, we'd break the movement down into three parts and you'd set the pins. And let's say on the deadlift, you would, the first pull would be from the floor to the knee and you'd pull three reps and on the third rep you pull it against the top pin and hold it as long as you can until it mm -hmm. took you down then your next set would be you'd set the bar on top of that pin mm. you'd put another pin what a uh, six inches above that and you one two and on the third rep oh, pick, pull it and hold it up against the top pin as long as you can right and then mm. down and then the final one would be the top pull for an Olympic lift. And you'd set the bar on top of that. Then you shrug it up, shrug it up. And on the third rep, you just hold it up as long as you can. And you do the same thing in the squat, the bench press, any other lift. We found that cutting the lift into thirds was like too small. We cut it into halves. So on the benches, you would take down to halfway and then push back up. And you push up against the top pin, which helps you lock out. 
Yeah, I think there's some, I, I, I think that's dessert. I don't think it's the main course. I don't think it's the meat and potatoes, but I, I think it's a tasty dessert. Yeah. Just throw it in one day, see what happens. And then back to. No, 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 no. I mean, I, I would, I mean, I don't throw anything in just one day. If you're going to include something, put it in for at least four weeks. Hmm. That, that way you get a fix if there's validity to it. Right. Yeah. That's neighbors. <laughs> My... I thought, I thought maybe it was the owl. <laughs> Could have been. <laughs> Sometimes I do think it makes some noise. Uh, so anyway, all right. How are we doing, man? Yeah, um, we can uh, start to like wrap it up here. I don't, I don't want to take all of your uh, Sunday up. So, uh, um, when uh, so you're still doing quite a bit of writing, and like, what are you? Uh, oh, like, yeah, what yeah. are you, what are your current projects? Oh my God, I'm, I have. I'm under contract for seven articles a month okay uh in addition i always have a book project going uh and um i have a podcast every friday with iron company mm -hmm. we've got uh yeah if any of your people are interested in, in my strategies uh i would if if they're more lifters strong oriented i would uh, direct them toward purposeful primitive. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the hardcore manifesto. That's uh, 450 pages. They can get that through Dragon Door. If they're more broad-based, you know, regular type folks, certainly uh, Strong Medicine, which is a book I did with Dr. Chris Hardy. And uh, Chris is a top, top flight naval doctor. <clears throat> so this is, um, you know, generalized public. This is like the, the book you give your parents or something. You know, you know what I mean? Somebody uh, who's not in the best shape and wants to tighten up. This is, um, this is good stuff. Uh, anybody who's in the Washington, D.C. area, we're putting on an uh, intensive one-day clinic on the bench press and the overhead press. I'll have uh, Jim Steele with me. Uh, I'll have... Uh, six-time world champion, seven-time national champion, Kirk Karwoski. And we're going to drill down into both the, the bench press and the overhead press techniques. There's five variations in each of those two lifts. And we, we take the folks through each of the sequential variations. And uh, again, you've got uh, Kirk there, 600-pound raw bencher. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll, this is the second. We have like an ongoing series of uh i don't know we're uh, we're really trying to get these techniques out to the general public because we feel that it's the tech it's actually it's techniques and tactics mm -hmm. because in addition to every seminar where, where we workshop techniques there's always a tactical part of it yeah yeah that sounds good five variations of each that cause people can like dial in the ideas for people like pick like the main one that's right for them it's no like it's 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 more like work your way through boot camp mm -hmm. and 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 folks might not ever need to progress past a certain level it's not like oh it's like school that they have to go through all five grades but many many people never for example like we talked about they never really have to go past the kettlebell deadlift i mean that's plenty i mean mm -hmm listen you know that that's a fabulous exercise and there's there's no it's like oh if you don't go to barbell squatting you're a failure it's like no 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 you know wherever your whatever the tool is that allows you to exert maximally and safely that's that's where we want to be right right yeah very very cool so um how can uh people find you your uh ironcompany.com and uh you know we're uh, uh we're a big presence there uh jim Steele and i do a uh, seminar uh do a, a podcast every friday and, and that's live and we discuss every every topic under the sun additionally i post a column every week and uh you know it's uh, i'll talk about just about any crazy subject that comes to mind as it relates to health and fitness. So, you know, you really might want to check that out too. 
uh, yeah. because again, we, we, we carry so many uh, different topics, right? It's not just lifting. Mm-hmm. It's it's progressive resistance training. It's nutrition. Uh, it, it's cardiovascular training, and it's brain training, which we talked about. The psychology of the the the, the transformational effort. Right. My wife had to be in here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've read your uh, books. Oh, here we go. Medicine. We can, listen, they can sign sign up. Uh, it's a Facebook event, and at Functional Strength, or, or you can contact Stacy at somg1 at comcast.net, and it's the the workshops f- are filling up pretty pretty quickly. We have a lot of high level professionals that come in. It's interesting, is that the uh, we have a great mix of absolute beginners and in the highest levels of these world champion athletes and these uh, these elite military guys but everyone can train together because the the techniques and the, the tactics are the same it's just yeah. what difference is the, the payloads and the intensities right right so it's a, it's a, it's an interesting mix and and again it's uh, we're getting we just want to spread the word, man. We're just getting really such good results for anybody that, that is able to, to get a piece of our system and we buy their time back. It's, you don't have to spend uh, six hours in the gym a week and you're probably not getting any results for your six hours anyway. So let's right. maybe change some things up and let's get some people some real results. We certainly can do that. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense to me. I, I'm, I'm sure that is a big, big hit. And, uh, I, I appreciate your time and, uh, oh, yeah. thank, thank you. And we'll, uh, we'll certainly s- spread it around. I'll, I'll get it published today. And, um, so I'll go ahead and, uh, stop the recording and I'll, I'll talk to you for just a second after, uh, I stop it. Sure. Yes, sir. Uh, thank, thanks again. Th- thank you.